Welcome to the search for life in the universe with your students. My name is Martha Grover and I'll be moderating the session today. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech and uh, we're happy to be hosting the ABSCICON conference in Atlanta um, and to have, have this event also together, together with the conference. So at the end of, this, of the uh, session, we can also tell you about some of the other events that you might be interested in um, around this uh, astrobiology science conference. Um, and today we're here for the search for life in the universe with your students. So I'm happy to introduce our three presenters this evening. The first presenter is Graham Lau, who's an astrobiologist and communicator of science. Uh, his academic background includes biology, astrophysics, and geology. Um, and he's an expert on how living things affect the environment around them and how we search for alien life beyond Earth. Um, he's also the host of the NASA-funded show, Ask an Astrobiologist, um, and he serves as a uh, meditation instructor and public speaking coach. So Graham will start off and tell us about what is astrobiology. Uh, then we'll hear from Aaron Gronstall. Aaron's an astrobiologist, artist, and communication specialist with the NASA Astrobiology Program. And he's the author and illustrator of uh, NASA Astrobiology Graphic History Series. So he'll be talking in particular about the graphic novels. Um, and uh, as, a, as a scientist, his work has centered around microbial ecology and has spent time in field campaigns in deserts from Chile to Morocco. He also has a, a bachelor's in theater and performing arts and a PhD in geo microbiology and astrobiology. And our third presenter is Danny Leach, who's a middle and high school teacher of 25 years. She has a master's of science in space studies, and she created the first full year high school astrobiology course in Washington state. Uh, she's a strong proponent of using astrobiology content across K through 12 grades and disciplines and has been an active collaborator in the development of the NASA astrobiology learning progressions, um, which is what she's gonna be telling you about uh, in, in the workshop today. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing from our three speakers today as well. So first of all, I'll, I'll turn it over to Graham. Thank you very much, Martha. And if the audience is wondering, we're gonna be doing a little shuffling here uh, in one chair in the room that we're sharing. I do have the chat box open. So if questions come up at all, uh, we can also address those if needed uh, while we're speaking. Um, but I just wanted to give kind of a rough background of what astrobiology is. If you go online and you look up astrobiology, you might find something that astrobiology is the study of the origins and evolution, the distribution of life in the universe. But more than that, astrobiology is our quest to understand what life is. It's a very broad human quest that we've been undertaking for a very long time. And in my own life, I've kind of just always wanted to know what would aliens be like? Would they be like the creatures that we've, we've dreamed of in our science fiction and our films and comic books and that kind of stuff? Or could they be something way different than what we've imagined they could be? And so astrobiology is a way for us to try to understand what we can find out there. We can look at things that we have here on earth that maybe seem a little alien, uh, I really love kind of studying some of those weird, bizarre creatures from around our planet. Things like the Portuguese man of war, the deep sea giant isopod. They look fairly alien to me, and yet they very much are part of this large, diverse biosphere in which we live here in our planet. Life on Earth is extremely diverse and has come to fill so many different environments, uh, finding different ways to move, different ways to get food. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways that creatures have adapted to living here on the earth over the past 4 billion years. And a lot of the things we want to know in astrobiology is how did that start? How did life begin here on earth? Did it come to us from space, maybe being born on meteorites uh, coming to us from comets and asteroids? Or did life start in place here on the earth? Were there some chemical reactions in, you know, Charles Darwin's warm little ponds, perhaps? that could have allowed for life to begin here on our planet. 
astrobiologists want to know how life changed through time with the earth. How did our world and life evolve and adapt together? You know, life isn't just something that happens on a planet, it's something that happens to a planet. And as life has evolved along with our planet, it's changed a lot of the features of our world as well. Perhaps, for instance, you've heard that the oxygen in our atmosphere is being driven by life, that the oxygen that we have is itself a sign of life being here and being active in our world. There's astrobiologists who are also studying things like life in extreme environments. This is one of my favorite places on the planet. If you haven't been here, uh, it's in Yellowstone National Park. This is called Grand Prismatic Spring. There's a boardwalk down there in the lower right-hand side of this picture, and you can see some people walking around. It's a really beautiful hot spring feature to visit. And as you look at this feature in the, in the middle of this, this hot spring, you see some dark blue colors. But as you go towards the outside of the spring, you start seeing some greens and yellows, oranges and reds. And those are all caused by living things that thrive in this high temperature and very acidic environment. And so by studying some of those extreme places on our earth, by studying what life does on our earth, we can better know what to look for and we go uh, explore out there, looking at worlds like Venus and Mars, Titan, Europa, Enceladus, the worlds of our solar system to figure out if life happened somewhere else in our solar system, or maybe life happened here and went somewhere else in our solar system. Uh, Mars has been highly studied of late with lots of robotic missions, uh, including Perseverance and the Ingenuity drone, which have been flying around. Um, on the surface of Mars this past year. Uh, Venus is now a very interesting target for the potential for life to be in its atmosphere. Um, but there's also other targets in our solar system. One of my favorites is Europa, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter that has a thick icy crust, but down below that crust is a very deep ocean. And so a lot of us wanna know, could there be life inside of that ocean? Could there be things like hydrothermal vents like what we have here on the earth? things called black smokers, where we find these oases of life, where things are thriving in these deep ocean systems, uh, allowing for life to potentially have originated and evolved in these systems as well. Um, those of us studying astrobiology are also involved in a lot of mission development. Uh, in 2024, we're going to launch the Europa Clipper mission. It's going to go in orbit around Jupiter and Europa together and, and study the surface and give us more knowledge of what that ocean is really like. Uh, the European Space Agency also has the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer mission, or JUICE, uh, which will soon be going out to the Jovian system as well and studying Europa and other worlds. Uh, we also have a world in our solar system which actively leaks water out into space. There are plumes of water erupting from the southern hemisphere of Enceladus, a moon of Jupiter. That's also become a very uh, prioritized target for astrobiology. Um, we also have a world like Titan, a moon in our solar system orbiting around Saturn that has a very thick and dense atmosphere and presents a unique place for us to study the chemistry of a different world that has hydrocarbon lakes on its surface and where it rains ethane and methane rather than water. Um, and so in the not too distant future, we're going to launch the Dragonfly mission, a large car-sized drone that will fly around the surface of Titan and help us to better understand the chemical history of that world. And then, of course, you know, when I was a kid and in school, we didn't know of any exoplanets existing. And now we know of over 5,000 worlds that exist around other stars. And that has really changed the game in our exploration for what could be possible out there for life and looking for signs of life in some of these other worlds. And then in astrobiology, we also want to know what is the future of life? What's the future for our species here on this planet? And could it teach us more of what to look for in looking for life out there? Perhaps you've heard before of the Drake equation uh, sculpted by the astronomer Frank Drake in 1960. It was basically a, a, a conference proceedings for, for organizing sessions of a meeting, but it's become rather famous for uh, uh, this equation that helps us figure out based on a few factors that we know or could know about the potential for life in, in our galaxy, how many civilizations might be out there right now who can communicate with us via radio. And my favorite part of this equation is the very last factor, the L factor. It's the average time span for a civilization to exist. Uh, astrobiology very much helps us to frame our understanding of what it means to be a species in a biosphere where we're now coming to understand our place in the universe 
and our own fragile place in the cosmos. Uh, and so astrobiology has so very much to offer as a field in understanding our origins and, and how life thrives and evolves with the world and how we can look for life out there as well. Uh, and so that's just kind of a very broad general idea of what astrobiology is and some of the things that we're doing. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Aaron Gronstall, uh, who will share with you some of the resources that we have for teachers uh, to share astrobiology. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Gronstall, and I am actually just going to kind of do a little tour of the Astrobiology Program website here um, to start. So this is the, the, the Astrobiology site at NASA, um, and we have a whole bunch of resources here for, for education, and I just kind of wanted to, this is the landing page you go to and kind of show you where to navigate to things. Um, most stuff is right up here at the very top bar. Uh, the first thing, ask an astrobiologist. Um, this is an excellent series where Graham uh, does a lot of wonderful interviews with, with uh, scientists and, and people in the astrobiology field talking about their specialties and, and how they got into astrobiology and their kind of educational and career paths and things. It's a really, really wonderful resource if you have kind of specific things that, that you want to talk to your class about or have, you know, have them watch. Um, and the things are organized by the episodes down here. Um, you can find you can find kind of episodes based on certain topics. And then the second thing up here um, is just the education page that we have. And this is sort of a landing page for all things education at the astrobiology program. Um, going kind of slow right now. There we go. Um, and this talks about there's there's some features up here at the top at some of the big programs we've been doing. This is astrobiology for the incarcerated. Um, where Daniela Scalise, who's the, the, per, the blurry person in the back, back here, uh, she, she's kind of the communications lead for astrobiology at NASA, and, and she's worked really hard on this program, um, using astrobiology to, as an educational tool in, 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 in prisons. Um, and the NASA and the Navajo Nation, um, she's also done a lot of work with, with indigenous kind of uh, tribal governments and, and things uh, throughout the United States. And this is the astrobiographic histories. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, that later. And if you keep, kind of keep scrolling down here, there's a whole bunch of other stuff to get into. Um, this learning materials page here is just kind of a, a long list of different types of learning materials that we, we have, some of, some of which were sort of created in-house at astrobiology. Um, the astrobiology program funds a lot of teams at universities and and things like that. So these are these are resources that those university teams have developed over the years, and some other kind of things that we brought in from around NASA, and also um, you know some maybe former PIs on some research projects that have have developed some things. And so you can I mean scroll down this and this list goes on and on and it's sort of organized by things that are, you know, classroom materials. Um, this is this is a project in K through 12 classrooms. Uh, developed by one of our teams that we fund at Albion College. Uh, but yeah, so this wonderful place to go and kind of run around and check things out. Um, the, other, the other good thing at this top bar, so there's Ask an Astrobiologist, Education, and then at the end here, there's Resources. And this is sort of a direct link to some of the, the main things that we've developed in-house at the Astrobiology Program. Um, we have sort of digital backgrounds, if, some of, if any of you are still doing classes over Zoom and things, and and your students want to have some cool backgrounds of Mars or Europa, the one that I was sitting in front of before is, is um, from, the, from the graphic histories and it's a Europa one. So there's the Arecibo telescope. There's kind of fun, fun things to play around in there. Um, there's this extremophile trading card uh, series that was done uh, by the, within, in, I think the University of Wisconsin. Um, so these are this, when Graham was talking about the kind of the microbes that live in the grand prismatic spring and things. Uh, this is a series of trading cards that kind of describe all these different kinds of microbes that live in these crazy environments or crazy to us, but, but what they call home. And um, there's also these kind of hero posters that are, we're taking sort of from the graphic novels. We took some of the main kind of missions and things and made these posters that kind of describe what the missions are and, and why, they're, why they're heroes for astrobiology. And also there's, so there's coloring pages as well. Um, if, you're, if you're with some younger students and things and 
these are some of these are kind of coloring pages with activities sort of built in like uh, this one's the the perseverance rover in the clean room and you know the suggestion is to draw the microbes that they're finding you know as they're making sure it's clean before it goes to mars okay and so the main but the main thing that i'm, I'm kind of my my big project that i work on part of the time is a uh, the graphic history series and this was a a series of comic books basically that that uh, we started developing um, at, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of exobiology uh, at NASA. So exobiology is actually, it's been around for a long time. The first grant was uh, given for the wolf trap instrument that was being developed for the Viking mission. It didn't actually make it on the mission, but, but that was what, the, what it was for. And so uh, I got into this, I was already working at the astrobiology program office, but uh, Mary Wojtek, who's the program scientist, knew that I, I grew up drawing comic books and I, I always have, always will. Uh, my mother was an artist, is, is a visual artist, uh, but mostly paint and kind of abstract inks. And my father's a musician, so I grew up in a, in a very artsy household. So art has always been a big part of my life. And um, when the 50th anniversary came around, she was like, well, let's, let's make use of that. Let's make a, a comic to celebrate that we can hand out at the, at the 50th anniversary events. And it turned out that people really liked it. And so they kind of, we just decided to keep doing it as long as, as long as we can keep thinking up new things to, to, to make an issue about. And, and as long as people are still interested and, and now they've, they're being used in a number of classrooms. Um, we've had a lot of sort of museums that you will use them in, uh, you know, programs for kids that come into the museum and that sort of stuff. And, and some of my favorite stuff has been art museums using it or, or art classrooms using it because it's a, it's a great way to get students who maybe don't even know that they're interested in science kind of thinking about the science and things. And these, each issue is sort of organized around a different topic. This one, the first one is just sort of an introduction to like, what is astrobiology and, and the history of how it began at NASA and, and, you know, actually began even before NASA, like as, as it's the question of life beyond our planet is, is a pretty old question and, and the origin of life on our planet. So it goes through some of like the main scientific findings over the years, some of the big scientists and things that have, that have worked on these problems. And all the scientists that are in the issues are, are actual people and actual discoveries that were made. And if you, if you kind of go to the final pages of the, of the issues, there's actually a list of references. Um, so you can, you can find further information and, and everything is, is referenced if you, need, if you need to dig in a bit deeper or your students need to dig, dig in, in a bit deeper to things. How do I go back? Where's your back button, Graham? I did open a new window. Where's the old window? Where are your tabs? Uh, it's hidden by the zoom bar. Um, grab that, pull it down. There you go. Say uh, control W or command W. Sorry about that. Okay, so there's, there's, there's a bunch of different issues. There's this origin issue. Oh, and some of them have been translated into other languages. Um, there's some Korean editions and there's a Japanese edition um, of some of the issues. Uh, the second one is all missions to Mars. The third one was sort of missions to the inner solar system. Fourth was missions to the outer solar system. We've got stuff about Earth, exoplanets, um, and prebiotic chemistry and the origin of life. And then this is the brand new issue that uh, was just released yesterday in, on biosignatures. And so that kind of talks about when we're looking for life beyond Earth, what are we looking for and why are we looking for it and how, how do we look for it? So all the, all the kind of different things that the scientists are looking for. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of the graphic histories. I can talk about that more if you have questions about how, you know, the, my actual process of making them. Um, they're all done hand, pencil and, and ink by hand and then and the men do the, the colors and the layouts and everything digitally. Um, but then kind of the other really amazing thing that we have that I think is probably the most, probably the most important thing um, is this, the, edu the learning progressions that, that uh, Danny is going to talk about. So to get to those, um, if you go back to this education page and go, where is it, Danny? It is on here. There you go, the astrobiology learning progressions. So this is how this is how you get to the learning progressions on the astrobiology website. So on that main major education page, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hand things off to Danny and and let her explain exactly what the what the learning progressions are. All right, Great, thank you so much. Yes, actually, everything that Graham and 
um, Aaron have talked about, I've used in my classes, <laughs> literally every single thing. Um, and I'll be able to screen share once you guys are out of that, but it's okay. Um, hey, got it. <laughs> perfect. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Danny Leach. I have um, been, um, like my intro, been teaching um, science and astrobiology and math and all sorts of things for a long time, 26 years. And um, my background today is um, the Hubble Deep Field image. And this was one of the things that blew my mind when I first uh, learned about astrobiology and just started to get into it. As, um, this is from, like I said, the Hubble, and it was a, uh, an image taken over a really long period of time. And in fact, every single dot that's there, um, well, first I'll tell you, it's only covering a really boring part of the sky, and it only is covering uh, a section of sky that is about the size of um, a pencil eraser held at arm's length up in the sky, and that's how much coverage it was. But in just that tiny little bit in the sky, each one of these um, dots that are behind me are actually from an entire galaxy of hundreds of millions of stars each. And um, of course, we, had, we don't know, but we're assuming there's lots of planets around each of, or many of them. And um, that just blew my mind. And, and when, that was one of the ideas that jumped um, for me when I started to dig into this. And I share that with students and they, <laughs> they love it too. Um, there we go. So there's a QR code there to jump right where um, Aaron was saying to get into the astrobiology learning progression. Um, but I'm going to show you that in a little bit as well. So uh, not, you don't have to worry about grabbing it right there. I'm going to get it to you in a little bit too. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to share with you today is just why or how, both of those, you can get um, astrobiology concepts, this idea of searching for life in the universe. Why is it here? Where is it elsewhere? And how do we find out? Um, why this would be good in your classroom and how can you, you know, make that happen. Um, and so giving you support in that. So first off, um, it's wonderful in your classrooms because students are super interested in it. I would say that it's not just students. I think humans are super interested. These are questions that people are interested in for a very long period of time. And um, almost every science news that you hear about is actually, you can, it comes back to a lot of times um, is there life there? Could there be life there? And how are we going to find out? So these types of questions like, um, is there life on Mars? Um, can we use technology to search for life? How are we going to do that? Um, brings in students and gets them really excited. And that can be, as you well know, I'm sure you know, um, one of our biggest obstacles. It's also awesome for teachers. Um, we have huge demands placed on us. Um, it is not what many think where you just have these lists of a small number of the standards that you have to hit each year. No, the demands on teachers are we not only have to cover all of the standards for our content, but we also need to support the standards in the math and also engineering and also the writing and um, 21st century skills. And there's so much that um, our demand is of us. So astrobiology is great because it inherently uses science concepts from all, all sciences. So you don't have to be teaching biology. You could be teaching a concept in chemistry or physics or geology or astronomy and oceanography, climatology, <laughs> meteorology, and you could bring some aspect of astrobiology could help you bring that to life for them. Um, also, it's easy to build into areas um, such as creative writing, uh, math, uh, technology, uh, reading comprehension, writing, it, it can do all of those things very well. Um, and the biggest thing is it's engaging and it's relevant. So the students are excited about these ideas and they're willing to spend time thinking of them. And it's also bringing in things that are happening right now. So the questions that students ask are the same questions that scientists are out there trying to answer. And new discoveries will be learned along the way. So not only will you be teaching something about astrobiology, but throughout the year, something in that topic will be <laughs> announced on uh, whatever news or article that it might be. And so it's um, both of those things. It's also really, like I said, it's also timely because it is gonna keep changing for us. Um, and when we can 
figure out a way to help kids be curious, then we're setting ourselves up to have the best um, learning opportunities that we can. So this little guy who looks huge right now, but is actually microscopic, is one of our friends in um, astrobiology, and this is the tardigrade, also known as the moth piglet or the water bear. And, you know, it just gives you these, this is a, a, an organism that's an animal in a complex life form. However, it's a microscopic. So when I'm thinking about how I might have to teach kingdoms of life, you know, what are the different categories? Um, you can actually bring these little guys into your classroom, um, order them online, and there's a variety of ways to do that. Put them under microscopes and find them and watch them. And then you can learn about where do they fit. Um, this is a topic, this, these little guys are interesting in astrobiology because um, even on um, the International Space Station, they were put out on the outside of it and they didn't die. They came back in and they were brought back, maybe brought back to life is a little harsh, but anyway, they were able to um, continue living. And uh, because of that, those kind of in crazy and interesting qualities, um, some questions about could life go from one place to another in the solar system? or beyond. Um, so I can think of maybe taking something in a lesson or a unit that maybe needs some, some up, some revving up, and you could think about some ways and explore with you, I'll show, explore with you on how we could do that. Graham showed you a picture of the Grand Prismatic Spring, and it is just one of those really cool places that astrobiology looks at, but anybody who goes there um, everybody who's lined up there are an astrobiologist. They're all is there enjoying themselves because it is just interesting all by itself. So um, then, there, you know, just kind of thinking of other topics you might be thinking about in your classes, you know, photosynthesis, Big Bang, um, trying to do that claim evidence reasoning that we're doing across the board. Uh, all of those things have ways that we can come up with a question or an angle that could help you in bringing some energy and life to it and capturing the attention and then teaching the piece that you wanna make sure they get. So some of the ways that um, have been mentioned already, but I also wanna mention a few others. Um, NASA Wavelength has a ton of lessons, um, STEM engagement, and we can put these in the chat at the end as well. Um, NASA Express is sent to you, I think it's pretty much weekly and they have great ideas. And then what I wanted to share with you today is the astrobiology learning progressions. So this is right from the website about why we had this, but the, the creation of the astrobiology learning progressions mainly was twofold. One, we wanted to help teachers feel really comfortable in providing um, and, and creating units for their students um, in an area that they have probably not a lot of experience. You know, I went to college, we took classes, a variety of science classes, so did you, um, but very few of us took an astrobiology course. And so because of that, um, we're going to have to kind of put out some, some time into learning something brand new to bring to our students. I don't think you have to know it all to be able to teach it all, but I do think you need to feel comfortable enough to be able to do that. And so um, that was one of the reasons for the development of the learning progression. The other one is actually to help scientists be able to communicate their work to students of different um, cognitive levels. And so I'm gonna show you how those are worked out and just run through something that I hope would be something you can use um, as we move forward. And it's not just a one and done, there's something that you can use on and off um, throughout your career. So all of astrobiology, we tried to take every question that um, people are looking into about life in the universe, where is it? How did it get here? Um, how did, is it somewhere else? and put it into seven core learning progression questions. And this helps with trying to narrow down the amount of information that you're gonna need to understand and feel comfortable with so that you're not reading the entire book or taking an entire class on astrobiology. We're just gonna get you comfortable in, the, in one area and then you'll take it from there. But because that was even too much um, potentially, we also broke it down to sub questions. So every core question is then broken down into several um, core um, sub questions. And this, um, you may not know at first where you're going with a question that you wanna work on or a unit or an idea that you wanna search out, but by clicking around for a little bit, 
and seeing what um, it looks like, I think that you will become comfortable really quickly. So the, the fact that right now it's a long list, um, I don't want to that to be um, you know, inaccessible. I think it's really gonna, you're gonna jump into a couple of things quickly and be able to understand what's there and move forward with it. So the, um, the breakdown of the pro progression. So uh, like Aaron was saying, it's on the website and um, I'll get you a QR code in the website at the end as well. But what it looks like is um, it's broken down by the core learning questions and then the sub questions. And then there is this, what we're calling progress storyline. And then there's some different tabs, um, NGSS connections for teachers. So we're gonna talk about some standards, concept boundaries for scientists. So when you work with scientists, you can make good um, positive moments with them. And then resources that are, those will be lessons and things that you could use right away. And then occasionally some of the questions do have storyline extensions, meaning that this might be a little beyond K-12, but we wanted to put it in anyway. So, um, and this is kind of in a grid, if you wanna think of it that way, with um, different grade bands. So we're gonna take a look at that, okay? So we've created uh, four grade bands, K-2, three to five, six to eight, nine to 12. Um, as a guide for, for everybody. And, and when you click on the left or the right, you'll be able to change from one to the next, but stay in the same core learning question. Okay, so what why does that help you? Is it helps you zero in on the information that you exactly need for the grade that you're, you have. So the progress, um, the progress um, information here, the, the storylines, what those basically are, is a way of taking this concept, this question that you're looking at, and then saying, well, okay, how did we get here? What are the main ideas? What are the, what's the research being done? How are they forming questions? And then thinking of it in terms of what would be appropriate for that grade band. Um, so I mean, appropriate as in like cognitive level. And so um, as you getting used to a certain topic, I would suggest that if you are, a, uh, a K2 or three, five or six, eight, whatever you are, teacher, I would also look at the higher grade bands um, as well and read that because that'll give you more of a, a feel and information about where it's headed towards. Um, and that'll help, you know, make it easier for you to bring it to your students in their cognitive level range. So um, that's something that we as teachers do all the time. <laughs> but um, it's here for you by being able to go left and right on that. So if you are, um, I'm just gonna run an example and, and think about you know, if this works for you. And of course there's lots of different um, questions that are there. But um, so let's say we have an eighth grade teacher planning a unit, definitely wants to hit something about atom creation, about atoms, about the big bang. After clicking around on the core learning questions, then it would become pretty obvious pretty quick that we really wanna be in 1.1, which is, are we really made of star stuff? Um, if it's an eighth grade teacher, zooming into the eighth grade, sixth, eighth grade band would be great. It also, like I said, would be awesome to take a look at the 912. And then another, um, additionally, we have this NGSS connections for teachers. And what that is, um, is we have taken the NGSS um, DCIs, as well as the cross cutting um, concepts and put them into information that you could easily get quickly. So if you want to do something around this topic, if you click on that, you would then see all of the standards that we think could be addressed by this topic and some of, and the resources that are here. So as the teacher, it's your job to, of course, as you well know, um, you'll be in charge of making sure that you do hit it to the depth that you need to. Um, but we've kind of went through and looked at all the NGSS DCIs and said, okay, these are the things that could fit for this particular question. Um, we also did that with the cross-cutting concepts. And um, I think that you could even go further with the cross-cutting concepts to potentially add some more, um, but definitely the ones that are there are ones that you'll, you would um, feel confident that you could hit during this type of unit. And um, I also will mention that we didn't put in the science and um, engineering practices because things like developing models and interpreting data and asking questions were literally in every single one 
of the sub question. And so instead of writing it each time, I just want to announce that is that you can, um, by the choices you make on how you set up your units or lessons and the types of question, um, types of lessons that you're doing, you'll make sure that it um, is hitting the science and engineering practice that you want to. Um, I'm not saying that any one lesson would therefore hit them all. I'm saying they're all available to be hit with that. Um, and then the resources are here as well. So the resources um, are all from, um, well, what I did was I went through all of uh, NASA Wavelength and took a look at all of the, um, actually I should move this on a little bit, hold on. There's our disciplinary core ideas. I'll just pause for a second since I went too far. And the cost saving concepts. And here's the resources. So what I had done is I took the lessons that were in uh, NASA Wavelength and deciphered whether or not they were astrobiology, because sometimes they're just astronomy or um, physics, and took all of those and then broke them down into what category for what um, sub, sub question for every single question and put them into a list for you. So if you are on a page for 1.1, we are all made, um, are we really made of star stuff? Then you click on the resources page. This will be all things for that topic. Um, and then they're also by grade band as well. So there should be a lot of things there that you can then quickly with the, with the, um, with the links there, jump into different things. And um, that's the plan is to help you quickly get comfortable Know that you hit your standards while you're while you're creating these units, and give you lessons that can help you uh, in that supporting as area as well. Um, so the point of being able to do that is um, certainly to just help you try to be more comfortable and confident, so that you can bring these in together and honor and respect the time that it takes to create these units. I would also mention that you definitely we all have to consider that. The lessons and units that we are doing now in a few years are going to need to be revamped because that's part of what um, what we need to do to stay more to stay relevant. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to come back to the astrobiology learning progressions more than once and keep building and 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 changing up things as you as new things are being discovered um, and and that are out in the news and keeping things relevant and motivating for students. So um, I also wanted to mention that sometimes we do work with scientists and the astrobiology learning progressions do help scientists with their communication um, as well. And, and really what the problem was, is, and it happened in my class too, is I, I thought I had this great setup for my students to learn something really important from a scientist. And then my scientists who loves precise language like cork and Adam uh, lost my kids. And as you probably know, just as much as I do, is that students don't always ask the questions that they need to have answered. If they get confused, sometimes they just check out or disengage. And so what could have been this home run lesson kind of just wasn't there. And um, the plan is then that scientists can also take a look at the, the um, learning progressions and get some information about how to talk to and work with your students. So certainly they know what their, their content is quite well, um, but what they don't know is what are some boundaries? What are some things that you probably shouldn't bring up and given them permission to use other sets of words and examples? So um, for like my example for Adam, we don't bring up the word Adam is really not taught until middle school, but if you're talking with a third grade class, um, you might be able to use the word stuff or super tiny particles <laughs> or matter. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that scientists can find in, um, in the learning progressions as well. So if you're working with somebody, you can bring that out and you can um, say, hey, you know, you're going to be working with us this week. I've got this resource. I'm going to send it to you. Um, definitely take a look at the concept boundaries for scientists and let me know if you want to talk some more about how to help our kids, you know, in this, in this great, make it fantastic. Um, we've been presenting this to uh, scientists as well, and the feedback we're getting from them is that it's, it's working for them and that they like the 
ability to go study something to learn about how to, to approach students and, and kind of word choices and idea choices. Um, and within this as well, they will also have uh, the resources because that might come in handy too. That way nobody has to come up with a brand new lesson necessarily they might use something that they've already used. So that's some of my information. Um, here we have a couple of other, that, like I said, I was gonna have um, everything here at the end. Um, so here on the left-hand side, that's how you, you can use that QR code or the link there and you can go to the astrobiology learning progression. Um, here's the stuff all about at Ask an Astrobiologist, the graphic histories. And also um, we have another abscicon, um, uh, education um, public event coming up this week. And so I want to invite you to that as well. Um, that is going to be the Jovian Safari. And what um, what that is implying is that you're going to be getting all the up-to-date images and information and discoveries about Jupiter and its moons. And so we really hope that you um, would feel like this is a good talk. We're going to add to it. We're going to keep get things rolling. And um, I'm gonna move it back over to Martha now. And I do wanna, um, before I completely do that, I'll just say that I would love that if you guys, since I'm gonna leave the screen up here for a little bit, if you guys have your own devices, use those QR codes, go ahead right now even, and get things bookmarked or listed so that you can use these, um, open another tab and take care of that. But don't leave us yet because we have, a, we have more time for questions and um, for everybody that's here. So thank you so much. And really, I really appreciate that you guys have all come out here on a number year three of a really hard time from years before that were that weren't that easy either. Um, and uh, the time that you took today to come out to something like this after a long day of work, I really appreciate your time and the work that you're doing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Danny and Aaron and Graham. And thank you all for coming. And we have time now for questions. Uh, so um, feel free if you'd like to unmute and ask a question. We, all 36 are still here from, uh, from, from the beginning. And um, feel free to unmute, or if you prefer, uh, you can just type in the chat. Um, but, but any of us would just be happy to, to take any of your questions. Okay, have all exoplanets found to be located in a certain part of the galaxy? Exoplanets. You go ahead, no, no. <laughs> so, so exoplanets, I mean, for, for us to discover exoplanets, um, it takes, takes a lot of kind of hard work with the telescopes and, and a lot of luck actually that the planet's in the right place to kind of pass in front of its stars so that we can see it and or the other kind of gravitational ways that they, they discover them. But so far, most of the planets that we found are in the Milky Way, um, things that our own galaxy um, that we're in. Um, there are a couple, I think maybe two, there's a handful that have been found and identified outside of our galaxy and other galaxies. But um, part of that's probably a limitation of, of the technology that we have right now and, and the strength of our telescopes, you know, how far we can actually see and identify things. So. And I, I think I'll, I'll add to that a little bit as well. Um, the, the, most of the exoplanets we have found, so we, have, we have found some close to the center of our galaxy. Uh, the Milky Way is a big disk and in the middle there's a nice big bulge of stars and and so we've, we've seen some around some of these really big highly energetic stars towards the center of our galaxy, but most of the exoplanets we've seen so far are within just a few thousand light years of our own solar system. And so of our galaxy, which is roughly 100,000 light years wide, the ones that we found are in a small circle kind of around our own solar system, um, and most of them are towards the constellation Cygnus. Um, that's the swan that we see in the sky overhead. Of, it's one of the, the 88 accepted constellations from the International Astronautical Union. Um, the reason that we, we found most of them there so far is actually because of the mission Kepler, which was looking towards a little swath of space 
in that area. And so there's like a, a little cone kind of going out that, that that telescope was looking at for several years. And that's where most of the exoplanets we've found, we found so far are in that realm. Well, this is a fun one. Um, probably Aaron would be the best for this. Uh, can you tell us more about projects with incarcerated individuals? Oh, I mean, I, yeah, I can. So, I mean, the the best person to to speak about this is Daniela. This was this was really a project that she worked with, and she worked. Um, I mean, she partnered with some other organizations that were working inside prisons, and sort of just it, it would. The, um, let's see. I think it started in Washington State. Was the first one. They've they've worked in Florida. Um, I think it's, a, it's about five states or so that she's worked in prisons and actually brought um, astrobiologists into the prison to give, give lectures. And um, most, most of them were, were adults who were incarcerated, but there was, there was one sort of youth, um, um, I hate saying the word prison, but you know, like I, I, I kind of, of, of incarcerated youth that she was working with. Uh, there is some information on the website. If you look on that, there's, there's a pretty in-depth article kind of talking about what the project is and and how hopefully they'll be they, they'll be expanding that in the future. <laughs> I would also just add that um, there is a there is a slice of um, of the astrobiology that you can use to help students with actually being able to get along with each other and make um, group decisions and also seeing themselves kind of in a different location. And that's part of the idea of the work with the um, incarcerated is that. You may not be able to talk about easily what's going on with you and and what has happened with you, but you can talk about um, an enclosed space on Mars and how that would be really hard to get along with everybody and how would you set that up and and what sorts of challenges would you face and that can bring out some um, some some interesting and wonderful things and that's true with um, with everybody, including kids at school who might have maybe a harder time to explain you know, how they're doing and having those kinds of same kinds of struggles. Um, Jeffrey, there was a question, you had a hand up. Did you want to unmute and um, tell us what you had there? <laughs> he said that was an accident. <laughs> okay, no worries. And there was a question about what are some internships that may be available to high schools um, interested in astrobiology and wanting to major in this. Uh, there's there's some information on the astrobiology program website about that as well. There's um, some resources for for early career. Um, high school is 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 younger than that, but um, there's also a lot of the so so we as a funding body we fund you know researchers at universities and things, and they have often have. Um, programs that they run themselves with their own teams that, that, that work with kind of local high schools and that, that sort of thing. So always feel free to contact us if you have any questions or if you're, if you're you know, you have a student that is looking for a placement or something, maybe we can help. Um, there's also, we have the Ast Astrobiology Communications Guild that we can reach out to a lot of people involved in astrobiology that might have some, some good ideas on, on how to find good places for, for your students to, to get involved. Um, yeah. <laughs> And what colleges have astrobiology programs? Uh, I mean, there's some, there's some, there's like too many for me to remember off the top of my head now. Um, I do think there is an undergraduate program now somewhere. You know, yeah, there's a couple. There is a list on the web on the astrobiology program website too that we try to keep up to date of of what colleges and universities have actual kind of degree programs in astrobiology. There's a number that have like a class a class or two, but there's also um, there's a lot of astrobiologists that get into the field going, you know via another form, you know, another area of science, like maybe they're studying geology or astronomy and then, and kind of as they move through their career, sort of involved in astrobiology and, and different, and in different kind of facets of, of, of the discipline. Yeah. What's the question? Are there some gas giants like hot Jupiters that might sustain some form of life? Um, so while, while hot Jupiters are, are a little bit different than, than some of the things we talk about being in the habitable zone, um, you know, we, we had this vision for what planets were and how they formed. And then that all changed after 1995. 
Uh, so the very first exoplanet detections were in 1992, but the very first detections of worlds around other stars that are kind of similar to our sun, uh, they fall in what we call the main sequence. It's kind of the, the main the main band of where most stars are. They're not like super giant stars or neutron stars or white dwarfs. Uh, so in 1995, we started discovering these worlds around stars and the ones that were the easiest to find right away were really big and really close to their stars. So the, the hot Jupiters, uh, they're large gas giants like Jupiter or Saturn or even bigger. Uh, and they, they orbit their stars, sometimes a period as short as just a couple of days. So they're whizzing around their stars super fast. Um, they made us have to rethink how planets form. And we had to, had to probably move uh, after they form and can move around in the solar system. And our own solar system probably had some movement of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, but the, those hot Jupiters are very much large gaseous worlds, just like Jupiter and Saturn. Um, now, I would personally say that there, there could be life in those kinds of worlds. Even Carl Sagan in the original Cosmos envisioned a, a world like Jupiter having its own biosphere of what he called floaters and sinkers um, inside of this gas giant, which is really cool to think about. Um, but in our own solar system, we don't think Jupiter and Saturn have life, at least not life as we know it. Uh, and so we're not really looking to those hot Jupiters right now for potential signs of life. At least we, ha we haven't had good reason to yet. But when it comes to thinking about what's, what's habitable out there, there's this region around stars that we call the Goldilocks zone. Um, technically, it's the Goldilocks zone for liquid water. Uh, if you recall the, uh, the fairy tale of, of Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, that there's the porridge is too hot, the porridge is too cold, the porridge is just right. So in the Goldilocks zone for liquid water, it's the region around a star where the temperature could be just right at the surface of that world uh, for liquid oceans to exist. Uh, now that's based only on its orbit around its star. It doesn't take into consideration the actual composition of the world or whether or not it has an atmosphere. Um, worlds like Venus could very much be in the same position as Earth is around their star and still have surfaces that are hundreds of degrees Celsius, many hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, um, and so be totally uninhabitable for life as we know it. But it is a very good place for us to start looking for signs of life on some of these exoplanets that are out there and trying to find life. And so a lot of our current work in, in looking for biosignatures, signs of life on exoplanets, is very much targeting those worlds that are kind of in that region, the Goldilocks zone for liquid water around their stars. Well, this is a fun question from Jeffrey Bergen. Uh, is there any search for non-carbon or water-dependent life forms being looked at? Uh, it's a very good question, Jeffrey. Um, I, I teach a class, uh, an intro astrobiology course that I, I teach, where I, I basically go through some chemistry of why carbon is probably the best element for a backbone for life, way better than silicon, uh, and why water is probably the best solvent for life, at least life as we know it. Um, however, that's not to say that, that, that there couldn't be silicon-based life out there or life based on some other molecule um, or some other element for its backbone. There's also quite a potential that, that there could be life that thrives in supercritical carbon dioxide or that thrives in hydrocarbon lakes like the ones that we find on Titan. Um, so there certainly could be other forms of life out there. That said, most of what we're looking for right now is very reliant on the life that we do know the life that we have here on Earth, um, because we don't quite know yet what kinds of biosignatures to look at for silicon-based life or, or other forms of life out there. I will say, I will say though, that the, um, like what Graham, Graham said is absolutely right, but uh, we are looking at ways of identifying life that, um, and what we call agnostic biosignatures. Um, so looking for life in ways that we can find something even we don't really know what we're looking for. And, and one kind of cool example that's come out recently in the past year is um, looking, at like looking at probability as a way to det detect life and sort of thinking about it as um, if you have a system and you have sort of a level of complexity that you can reach in that system based on physics and chemistry, but you find something that's more complex than that system can produce, then there was some sort of extra push to get to that level of complexity. So it's sort of like if you landed on Mars and there was an iPhone laying there on the ground, like the iPhone's not alive, but 
you know that it was made by something because it's way too like you don't just get an iphone being made from rocks on mars out of you know, out of nothing you know so you know that there was some step involved in there and, and so that there's there's a team um what, what they call the like lab, laboratory for agnostic biosignatures that looking that looking at ways of identifying sort of life as that little extra push of energy you need in the system to get to a certain level of complexity if that makes sense so there, there are people that are thinking about ways of identifying life that 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 aren't dependent on exactly on what we know is like here. But. <laughs> cool. Are there other questions? I should say, like, that's that's also covered in issue eight. Of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, shameless plug for the in issue eight of the graphic history, which is out now. <laughs> All about biosignatures. I'm issue seven. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one from Bayon. Could life, could extraterrestrial life exist in other dimensions? Um, the true answer is we don't know because we don't even know if other dimensions are existing out there. Um, I imagine you're thinking of things like the multiverse. Um, it's interesting to think about, but it's definitely beyond the realm of current science and our current paradigms of science. Ooh, from Abdullah, you use the iPhone as an example. What are they looking for as a part of process up there? Um, I'm assuming that you mean like, what are we looking for for signs of life out there? Um, like Aaron mentioned, um, there is a team, the Laboratory for Agnostic Biosignatures, who are thinking about what kinds of signs of life could there could exist out there for us to find that aren't aren't necessarily terrestrial signs of life, that don't require the same biochemistry that we have, uh, the same evolutionary history of life as we have. Um, but we're also very much looking for for signs of life that we do know, um, the production of biosignature gases. Um, the production of techno signatures, um, a lot of things that life does that we can look for out there. Here's one, um, how likely is extraterrestrial life or intelligence? Um, that's also one that we really can't answer. We don't know how likely life is out there. I will say that, that sometimes people say that I, I, I tend to be that that person who can be a bummer <laughs> um, for some others, uh, I will say, so like based on logic and our knowledge of science, we have to admit that with our given evidence, we could be alone. But it doesn't feel likely. When you start thinking of the sheer number of stars and the number of planets that we're now certain exist out there based on the number we've found already, uh, and we start thinking of the, all the potential environments that are out there, it doesn't feel like we're alone it feels like there must be something else um you know there's that that famous phrase um that if it really is just us what a tremendous waste of space because it really feels like you know just given all the potential that there really should be life out there and honestly right, right now is a very incredible time to be alive in the history of astrobiology because we are just now developing space flight to explore our solar system and developing telescopes to orbit our world, to look at other worlds so far away. I mean, it's only been six decades plus, just a little bit since we've, we've traveled into space ourselves. And yet we are so very potentially close to seeing signs of life on another world if it's out there to be found. And that's pretty exciting. That's good to know. Um, from my side of it, um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all. <laughs> yeah, Martha, do you want to finish us off here? Well, I'd just like to, you know, thank everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. And, you know, we've shared our contact information in the chat um, and lots of other links. We've had an active chat going on um, in parallel to the discussion here. So, um, you know, just really encourage you uh, to, to check out some of these uh, resources. I also posted some of my own um, from Georgia Tech in the in the chat. So there are a lot of resources out there, but um, uh, you know, uh, uh, please continue exploring with your students and um, and just feel free to reach out. There will be a recording available, right? There will be a recording available. Yeah. So um, yeah, definitely, uh, we'll send out the recording. And uh, if there's anything you know you really that you want to refer back to or to share it with others, please do.
Great to see you all. Thanks, everyone.